Let's talk about semiconductors. What does it mean to semiconduct? Well, semiconductors basically are materials that have no Fermi surface and they have a, a band gap. Uh, and that's really about it. I mean, I, I think that in the past people would say, oh, they have to have a band gap of a certain size or uh, they have to be crystalline. But we've come to a point where that, that really isn't important because people have been working with uh, amorphous semiconductors. They've been working with wide band gap semiconductors. Uh, typically, you know, semiconductors have band gaps, you know, between, you know, tiny, for example, you know, 0 0.1 you know, electron volt up to 3, but uh, they, they do work with larger. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, why that's the case. The reason is, is, is it has to, to do with the fact that the semiconductors and insulators uh, cannot conduct because they cannot have a drift velocity. You know, consider our, our free electron model again, or nearly free electron model, if you will, in which we have energy versus K, so we have our dispersion. And let's have a band that does this, and a band that does this. All right, this is our nearly free electron bands. And <clears throat> if our Fermi level were sitting inside one of the bands, then that means that these states would be full, and the others would be empty. If we were to apply an electric field in the direction <coughs> of whatever k value this is, and you'll call this kz, for example, <coughs> then what would happen is that these states would start to become full, these states would start to become empty, and we'd have scattering. back to fill those empty states, right? This is a picture in which we had our uh, Fermi sphere, and uh, that was migrating. So the net average displacement would have some delta k. And this goes back to our concept of metals and having a drift velocity that depends on the degree of separation. If, however, draw this. If, however, we have a band that looks like this again, and now we put our, our uh, Fermi energy in the gap, then it means, and we're at our band edges, pi over a minus, uh, plus pi over a minus pi over a, then all of these states are filled. And if we apply an electric field, you know, the electrons uh, will migrate in k-space, but as they move, they all move together. And as a result, uh, there is no average offset, and the entire uh, K space is still centered on zero, so the drift velocity is zero. So in order for a semiconductor to conduct, we have to fix this problem of having a, a full and empty band. And we can do that through the promotion of an electron up into the band above it. And we typically refer to these as the conducting band and the valence band. Now that we've <coughs> excuse me. Now that we've created this, this electron is free to 
migrate in the electric field and the hole also under the influence of the electric field is, is able to migrate. So how do we get how do we get this excitation? Well, really, uh, the two most common are uh, thermal excitation and uh, optical. And we're going to start by talking about thermal thermal excitations. So let's redraw our band structure in a simple kind of two-band picture, something you'd see in your uh, sophomore level material science class. Gap in here. <clears throat> band gap has a E, G, some gap energy between it. Put an electron up here and an H for hole down below. And if we think about the density of states, which you can kind of lay it on its side here. So we have E again versus this. It's not inappropriate to imagine our density of states uh, as a free electron density of states with a uh, dependence that goes as uh, e to the one half. And you know that's not universally true. We know that, but we know that at the band edges, it's, it's a pretty good approximation. So the density of states at the uh, of the uh, electrons in the uh, valence band, oh sorry, uh, electrons in the conducting band, the density of holes in the uh, valence band would go as this. Pi squared 2me over h bar squared to the 3 halves e minus e c one half so e c is the energy of the conducting band and e v is the energy of the valence band the whole density of states is then h over h bar squared one half. Okay, so we got those. Now if we want to talk about the distribution of electrons within the density of states, we have to go back and think about our Fermi-Dirac statistics, in which E is equal to 1 over one. Now notice here I, I put the chemical potential in again, not the Fermi level, and, and that's because when we were talking about these before, we were talking about a metal, maybe we had a Fermi surface. Uh, we will get back to the definition of the chemical potential. Uh, but for now, I'll just keep chemical potential in there, and you remember that it's the energy to add or subtract uh, a particle from the system. <clears throat> now within this, when E minus mu is much larger than KBT, and such is the case in most semiconductors. If you get a semiconductor which is on the order of the thermal excita excitations, then uh, you know, a very, very narrow band gap material, uh, you start getting a little, a little bit different, a little bit wonky. But 
uh, most semiconductors, we're talking about a band gap on the order of one electron volt, so that's much larger than 25 milli electron volt. Then x e minus mu over k b t is much larger than 1. And we can take the approximation that this is going to be 1 over x of e minus mu over k b t. And we can put that up into the numerator by multiplying it by e to the minus 1, or sorry, by uh, putting a negative 1 in the, in the exponential. So that's going to be equal to exp of mu minus e over kbt. So that's a an approximation we can take for the Fermi Dirac distributions. <clears throat> now the holes is equal to 1 minus Fe, of course. <clears throat> is equal to 1 minus 1 over x of E minus mu over KBT plus 1 is equal to 1 over x of mu minus E over KBT plus 1 using the same approximation FH is approximately x of e minus mu over k b t. Okay. So if we have our uh, Fermi Dirac distribution and we have our density as a states, we can determine the concentration of electrons. And remember, we need that in order to uh, determine the uh, conductivity. And we can determine that by integrating from the conduction band edge up to infinity of the density of states of electrons times the uh, distribution of electrons e. So that is, and I will uh, erase this. This pens need a little bit of a breather, so let's switch over. In general, it's just not doing so well. Let's get a new pen. Okay, uh, let's get. 1 over 2 pi 2 me. Uh, this me is the mass of the electron, mh is the mass of the hole. 
see I'm going to write the solution over here. Uh, So this integral yields the concentration of electrons and performing the same integral for holes. So I'm going to call this uh, P. I'll just change the colors. How about that? If I make this a P for the concentration of positive carriers or holes, this becomes from minus infinity to the valence energy edge that becomes an H, this becomes an H, and then this becomes an H, and this becomes EV minus E. And that integral yields P is equal to <clears throat> to M H K B T over two pi H bar squared to the three halves exp <clears throat> of E V minus mu over K B T. Okay, there you have it. Now, uh, this now something that's convenient is it's convenient to talk about the product of n and p, and the reason it's convenient to do so is because if we take the product of n and p, we get 4kbt over 2 pi h bar squared to the third mass of the electron times the mass of the whole to the 3 halves x of minus e g over k b t. So you can see our product is independent of the chemical potential, is independent of the valence band and the conduction band edge, and instead we just have the energy of the band gap. And we know that E.g. is E.B. minus E.C. Uh, it's also common to take these and to rewrite them lumping together the uh, coefficients, the prefactors. And I will write that, I'm also going to write it up here because I'll, I'll save it on this side. N is equal to NC 
right? So I basically just took those prefactors and I put them into these capital N and C and NV and these values are called the effective density of states. If we're dealing with an intrinsic semiconductor, and we're going to be doing that right now, uh, we're not thinking about uh, dopants that are contributing to the charge carriers, then N and P have to be equal. So from this N and P, something interesting we can do is we can uh, give them each equal shares of this product. So we could also say N equals P equals the square root of NC NV X minus one half E gap over K B T. But also since they're equal, if you wanted to, we can set these two equal to each other. And in doing so, we get NC exp mu minus bt and we can collect these terms to give us that and C over N V is equal to X of E V minus mu over K B T X of E C minus mu over K B T. Notice we switched there because we had a, a negative when we brought it over the other side. Rearranging this further, we can get x of e v plus e c or k v e t x of two negative two mu over k v e t. So we can get x of 2 mu over k v t is equal to n v over n c. I switch sides here to get the negative out of that exponential. There's a common practice uh, of letting the zero energy be the valence band edge. So you know, we can set the, the zero for our energy arbitrarily. And if we let if we let uh, right over here. Um, I'll show right over here. We let uh, EG equals EC minus EV, or EC is equal to EG plus EV, which we can substitute into here to get uh, NV over NC. And then 
sine EV equal to zero, just at a convention, then this to zero, and we get Okay, and this NV over NC, and I had it written over here, but I erased it. Those two are equal except for the mass of the electron and the mass of the hole. So we have that NV over NC is equal to mass of the electron over the mass of the hole, three halves. Well, if we say that these two are equal, well, I'll leave that there for now. Uh, so I can substitute this in to here, and I can take the logarithm of the entire expression, and this will give us two mu over k b t is equal to three halves natural log of m e over m h plus e g over k b t. Or mu is equal to three-fourths k b t natural log of m e over mass of the whole plus e g over two. So that is the chemical potential of adding an electron to our system. And if we approximate that the mass of the hole and then the mass of the electron are equal, which is, strictly speaking, not exactly true, but if we take that to be true, then this just becomes E G over two. So the chemical potential is one half the band gap because we set the valence energy to zero, then the chemical potential is halfway in the gap. And this goes a long way toward telling us about the temperature dependence of conductivity in semiconductors, remembering that sigma is equal to N E mu. In this case, we get sigma is equal to N E mu e plus p e mu h. So we have the mobility of electrons and holes and the concentration of electrons and holes. Uh, our mobilities mu e is equal to the charge on the electron times the uh, time between scattering events over Me mu P is equal to the charge on an electron tau H over MH and of course in both of these cases we have Ne as a function of T and P as a function of T from above. So we have an expression to tell us about the uh, char number of charge carriers as a function of temperature, but for that we need the, uh, the, the gap. And 
there's different ways that we can get at the gap and get at the number of carriers and um, the charge of the carriers. For example, hull probe measurements are, are one technique. Uh, we can use optical measurements or, or we can use uh, calcul calculations, you know, density functional theory, uh, in particular density functional theory augmented with uh, GWBSE uh, calculations. But here I want to talk about optical measurements because optical measurements are fairly straightforward and they are also one of the two fundamental ways that we uh, excite electrons from the valence band into the conduction band. <clears throat> now, when we're thinking about light interacting with matter, we need to think about this as simply an electromagnetic wave. And we're not going to think about the oscillating magnetic field. It's not so important for the optical excitation. But the oscillating electric field is, and, and that's because you have this Uh, the notation I'm using here is uh, E, capital E for electric field, and, and when you have this oscillating electric field, the material undergoes a spontaneous polarization as these waves come in. And of course, when you're at zero, then the plus and minus are at the same point. So we can think about this as an excitation problem in which we have uh, polarization being induced by an electric field and Traditionally, we think about this using the dielectric susceptibility. Now, the dielectric susceptibility, uh, because the uh, E is oscillating, is what links the polarization to it. Uh, however, the susceptibility uh, depends on the frequency of the light or the frequency of the oscillating electric field. And if we talk about uh, polarizability as a function of frequency, at low frequency have a particular uh, polarizability, and we're not going to go down to, to static, but uh, you can if you want. Uh, at some point that drops off. And what's happening here is as the frequency increases, we reach a point that the frequency of switching is too fast for uh, permanent dipoles to reverse their positions. So this is a bipolar uh, switches here. Get another drop. And this region and this drop is the point where uh, ionic rearrangements within the, the solid stop uh, moving around. And we have these kind of freeze out frequencies. And then at some point, we have the next drop. And this range is the electro electronic. And in this case, thinking about the frequency of, of light, it really is the electronic that we're focusing on because it's much too fast much too high a frequency for the dipolar and ionic uh, contributions. So let's, let's think about this from a, a classical perspective and think about 
you will. You know, some nucleus, and I know this is a very cartoonish picture, but some electron, and this electron is going through some oscillations uh, due to an applied uh, field. And if we think about it uh, in the most simplistic way, we can think of this as a, a simple harmonic oscillator, which is, is not a bad approximation. It's not, again, not 100% true because we know that as we move the electron further away from the nucleus, uh, the force changes, but at least uh, within the approximation that we're, we're near the uh, nucleus, for example, uh, light atoms, we can treat it as a simple harmonic oscillator and we can give it a resonance frequency that goes as beta over m. So m is going to be the mass of our oscillator, the electron in this case, and beta that is the force constant acting on the electron. So basically, a simple harmonic oscillator, you have two masses and a spring, and this spring is the restoring force on the electron. We can now use this to create an equation of motion. We know that the uh, force due to the electric field is negative QE, and we know the force, the restoring force, due to the harmonic oscillator is uh, beta x is equal to m x naught squared, so m x naught squared, ah, try saying that again, m omega naught squared x from here. So we have that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. So I'm treating this as a, a one-dimensional problem. Is equal to the force from the electric field minus the force from the applied spring. Now, this electric field, which is driving the problem, we'll just write as a sinusoid. And that implies that our uh, position will also be expressible as a sinusoid. Substituting these back in, we get m d squared dx squared x naught sine omega t. Uh, I'm going to bring this over to the other side. I'll bring the uh, right term over plus m omega naught squared x naught sine omega t is equal to negative q e naught sine omega t. So I pulled my, uh, uh, collected the x terms on the right hand side. Uh, taking the derivatives, we get m negative omega naught squared x naught sine omega t plus m omega naught squared x naught sine omega t is equal to negative q e naught sine omega t. 
so we can get rid of our, our sinusoids to make the problem a little nicer to look at. Right up here, collecting terms, we have m negative omega squared minus omega naught squared x naught is equal to negative q e naught. Okay, and we know that this displacement is going to be what gives us our polarization, right? We know our polarization is equal to negative q x naught. It's the displace, uh, displacement of the uh, charge centers. So let's take and rearrange this top term to give us x naught is equal to negative q e over m omega naught squared minus omega squared, which means our dipole moment is equal to plus q e naught over, sorry, squared q plus q squared omega naught squared minus omega squared. And this is why I like keeping q just as the absolute value of the charge on electron, because these negative signs tend to come and go. So this solution is the solution if we have a classical oscillator. Uh, and it's assuming that the electric field and the and the uh, displacement are perfectly in phase, right? Because we uh, wrote them both as the same uh, sinusoid, but they're really not. There's going to be a lag between these, and that's really the the power of what's happening. Uh, and the way to get this is through adding a phase factor uh, into these in, into the uh, solution to say that there's going to be some lag between the displacement and the exciting excitation field. Uh, and what this is going to result in is it results in our dielectric susceptibility becoming complex. So. our ideal oscillator. And when the uh, dielectric susceptibility becomes complex, we're going to get chi now as a function of frequency is equal to an imaginary contribution. Sorry, not I. Uh, I'm going to call this Sorry, I couldn't read my notes. Uh, one plus, uh, so a real contribution and an imaginary contribution. So I'm calling that uh, chi sub one, chi sub two. And this is the complex dielectric susceptibility. Now, uh, getting at these is going to require using uh, scalar and vector fields and thinking about gauge and we're not going to do that here. So I'm just going to give you uh, the solution. And let's call this, sorry, I changed notation in my notes. R E, I want to make sure I stay consistent. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the solution. And then the solution is this. The real part of the dielectric susceptibility is h bar squared e squared over m omega sum j the uh, full bands and summing over j prime 
the empty bands. So we're summing over all the bands, but we're denoting the empty bands as J prime and the full bands as J. This is F J J prime divided by omega J J prime minus omega squared. And the imaginary contribution is equal to pi h bar q squared over 2 m omega omega sum j j prime. J and J prime having the same designation. F J J prime. And this is a direct delta of H bar omega J prime minus H bar omega J minus H bar omega. Okay, so that is our complex dielectric susceptibility, and we'll, we'll get into what these terms uh, mean. Uh, so let's uh, erase this. I think the most important term here, uh, at least for our uh, recognition of the importance of a band theory, is this FJJ prime. Uh, this FJJ prime, this is called the oscillator strength, and it has this h bar squared So this is called the oscillator strength, and what it's made of is it's made of this top part, which is uh, Fermi's golden rule. So Fermi's golden rule Fermi's golden rule uh, expresses the transition probability. So if I have a, a state and I have a final state, the probability of a transition from this initial state, which is psi j to psi j prime, is going to be proportional to integral psi j prime star o psi j. But that o is an operator that describes the transition. So in our case, this operator here is describing uh, the displacement of uh, the charge in space and it's giving us this uh, 
dipole transition. The, the second thing is, is it has this omega squared, and, and that comes from h bar omega j j prime being equal to e j prime minus e j. So if we want to, we can divide this by h bar. So this is describing the change in energy associated with the jump. So we're basically saying that the probability of a transition is going to be, or the uh, this oscillator strength, and the oscillator strength, see both of these are dependent on the oscillator strength. The oscillator strength is proportional to the probability of the of the uh, tra transition, transition occurring, and it's divided by the magnitude of the energy change. So a larger jump is going to have a, a lower uh, oscillator strength, which means it's going to have uh, a lower impact on these real and imaginary terms in our susceptibility. And notice we're taking this sum. This is a sum over all of the states. So we haven't even gotten into uh, uh, bands yet, but here we're, we're simply just saying that we're, we're going over, uh, let's say we have a, a series of, of states. Right? For example, this could be a, a molecule instead of a, a solid, and we're talking about uh, if these are, uh, let's say these are full, these are empty, then we're taking these sums over all of these first order transitions. Uh, so within these, uh, the real and the imaginary components of the susceptibility is the imaginary component uh, that, at least for our optical absorption, we're most interested in because this is telling us about the uh, field that's being converted into energy within the material, right? If, if the imaginary part is zero, then we go back and we had this classical solution in which we had nothing but a, a real uh, susceptibility. And we're not interested in that, we're interested in the real and imaginary so that we can have a uh, absorption of, of energy. So this, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, Okay, so what's happening here in this imaginary is that, again, we have the oscillator strength. This tells us about uh, the, it's not exactly the probability, but it tells us the, uh, it scales with the probability of the transition occurring and is divided by the uh, energy difference that the, the transition has to go through. And then we have this Dirac delta, and the Dirac delta is basically telling us that the absorption only occurs when energy is conserved. Right? So we're saying that if the incoming oscillation is sufficient to go from h bar, what am I calling this? I'm calling to our prime. So the, the light has to have the frequency. So we're not allowing uh, excess, uh, you know, you can't jump up to here or jump under. 
it has to be an exact transition. So this uh, sum here and here uh, are taken over the, uh, the states and we also then have to, to, to go from this into solids, we have to be thinking about bands, which means that if we have E, K, this, and let's say we have our uh, gap there, we got a Fermi level, then we're thinking about all possible transitions at every K point, and we're also thinking about these at between each band. So, so basically we have to have this gargantuan uh, integral and we replace the integral with a sum in order to, you know, in approximating the solution, we're going to approximate it as, as a sum uh, and uh, extract information about the uh, absorption. And what we're going to get is we're going to get something that looks like this. So we're going to have the complex susceptibility, which is proportional to the uh, optical absorption that goes to this. And what we're observing here is in these peaks, the one thing we're observing is we're observing the gap and then we're observing uh, relationships between the bands. So, for example, uh, for example, uh, this could be, you know, the uh, bands just starting to get turned on, and these peaks can represent regions where, for example, we might have bands that are highly parallel. And if we have bands that are highly parallel, then we have ah, sorry, I was drawing this wrong. Let's try because I said this is my my full bands. Sorry about that. regions where we have bands that are, are parallel, giving us uh, a region of the Brewon zone where we get uh, strong absorption peaks. Now, things that are worth pointing out is, is that what we're mostly interested in, at least for interested in measuring the gap, is this initial point. And there's really two characteristic types of gaps uh, we can find we can find gaps that look like this um, 
right? Call this alpha or absorption versus h power omega. We can find some materials. For example, gallium arsenide is a good example of this. That will do. And another example would be, for example, silicon. And in silicon, we have something. Let's see, silicon's band gap's a little bit smaller than gallium arsenide. And it's going to do something like. flat. And the difference between these is that silicon is a indirect band gap and guy arsenide is a direct band gap material. Direct band gap and indirect band gap materials, this has to do with the position of the highest occupied state and the lowest unoccupied state within K space. So for example, uh, if you have a band dispersion that looks like this, in which the highest uh, occupied and lowest empty are directly above each other, this is going to be a direct band gap material. And light can be directly absorbed. Gallium arsenide is a good example of these. Uh, in contrast, there are things such as indirect band gap materials, silicon being a good example, in which you will have a band gap or a band dispersion that will look like this. Now, in this case, uh, you can get a direct transition, and we see that, for example, right here, but it's lower energy to go to an indirect transition. However, we have a shift in the k-vector that's necessary. And that means that uh, when we're conserving energy and we're conserving momentum, uh, the momentum has to change. Uh, light, our photons, they have a lot of energy, but almost no momentum, right? They have no mass, essentially. Uh, so in order for us to see this momentum change, we have to have a photon coupled with a phonon. Phonons, unlike light, typically have lower energies, so you don't typically get phonon transitions across bands, but they carry with them a great deal of mass because they are these vibrating uh, atoms. So what we'll see is we'll see A transition to a we call it a virtual state in the gap, and then a second transition down. And when you have that second transition down, you have a phonon that is emitted. And here we have a photon. That is being absorbed for the transition. Energy conservation. H bar omega 1 plus H bar omega is equal to E. Let's call this, call this delta. Delta E. So this is going to be h bar omega of the photon, h bar 
omega of the phonon. And then this delta E is the difference between the uh, lowest, uh, high, highest occupied and lowest empty state. And this is what we're seeing here in silicon. So we see this kind of broad turn on. And, and what's happening here is that this point is really you know, the uh, bare minimum for our delta E. And as we uh, increase the energy, we're getting uh, more possible phonons that can contribute. Right? Because if you have right at delta E, then you have only a small population of phonons that can allow us to conserve energy and conserve momentum. So, so our K phonon is equal to uh, K uh, the lowest unoccupied K, so this would be K homo, right? K well, so here's the conservation of momentum. Like I said, if you have a, a relatively uh, low energy, then your virtual transition will be here, which means you have a very small population of phonons that will give you that change in momentum while conserving energy. If you have a higher energy and you have can you have virtual states all through here, then you have a wider possibility of phonons. And of course, once you have an energy sufficient to span the gap, which is here, then we start turning on a direct band gap type activity. Uh, now I, I drew this uh, as a uh, a phonon being emitted. It doesn't have to be that way. I could have drawn this another fashion as well. I could have drawn this as a this and so that's phonon having a phonon and a photon both being absorbed so I, I suppose when I said this was the uh, bare minimum that's not exactly right uh, so we're not getting a very accurate measure of the true band gap because we can have also uh, virtual states that are below the LUMO level and have the absorption of a phonon. So these uh, multi-step or multi-body interactions are what distinguishes the difference between a indirect and a direct band gap material. And I'd like to make one kind of last comment here about, oh, maybe it's not last, I have a couple here, but I want to make a comment about the, the nature of these states. Uh, it's kind of common for people to talk about uh, the band edges as though they are bonding and anti-bonding states, and that's not exactly true. Uh, and I want to kind of dispel that myth with uh, an example. Uh, the band edges really depend upon the uh, particular nature of the material and the states of the individual atoms in those materials. So for example, silicon. In the case of silicon, uh, if we think about this as a, as a tight binding model, then we have S states 
and we have p states, right? Like we have two and six p states. Um, we bring these together, the band is split, and what we get is we get our s states, this and our p states. And our Fermi energy is sitting between the HOMO and LUMO states of uh, the P states. So in the case of silicon, our uh, HOMO states are P bonding, and our LUMOs are P antibonding. In the case of germanium, uh, that's not the case. In the case of germanium, which is just one uh, row below silicon, we have S states and P states. And now we have our S states splitting and we have our P states splitting. So now the HOMO and LUMO states are P bonding and S antibonding. And notice that I drew these, this, this splitting of the S larger than the P. That has to do with the degree of overlap, right? So we know the S states tend to be uh, more extended than the, than the P, and that means we have a greater amount of overlap, so we have more splitting. And this is where uh, how germanium operates. And uh, if you go down one row from germanium to tin, say alpha tin, uh, we'll have something that looks like this. level, S, P, and alpha tin is a metal, or semi-metal if you want to call it that, uh, in which the Fermi level is sitting in the P anti-bonding, or P bonding states. So in, in this case, all of these states uh, depend upon, uh, and the ordering of these states depend upon uh, the exact details of the uh, atoms involved. And I, I'd like to, to wrap up this discussion just talking about a macrospo macroscopic uh, macroscopic uh, description of absorption uh, to put it in perspective for those of you that, that may be unfamiliar with uh, that may be unfamiliar with uh, quantum mechanics and, and a band theory, but are familiar with, with absorption. Uh, and in this case, you get the intensity of light that's being transmitted equal to the intensity that is incident x minus alpha x. That x, that's the thickness of the uh, material you're looking at. And this alpha, that alpha is your linear absorption coefficient. So I'm gonna put this kind of as a picture. Our linear absorption coefficient uh, alpha is one over x over i, and this also is proportional is proportional 
to our imaginary susceptibility. And then this is, of course, the, well, the, the true absorption. If you had a, a single crystal, uh, and, and as you start adding defects, grain boundaries, and, and the like, uh, then you also have scattering coming from those as well.